as Undersecretary for North American Affairs over the past four years, I have been uh, deeply involved in this issue. And if I had to sum up in one phrase, what do I think about it? I would say that achieving a better bilateral management of the migration phenomenon is our most pressing challenge, but also it's a great opportunity for our two countries. And based on this idea, and at risk of uh, repeating some of the things that have been said already, and also at the risk of deferring with some of them, I would like to center my, my comments, my presentation, on five points. Five questions. First, why is migration important for Mexico and the United States? Second, Mexico talks about shared responsibility. What exactly does that mean? Third, is Mexico doing its share? A question that was, uh, is important, as I have noticed today. Fourth, what are our, our views on what is going on in the United States? And finally, some ideas on how can we achieve a better management of the migration phenomenon. Why is it important? Migration has been a, content, a constant in human history. But nevertheless, its implications, social, economic, and political, have gained importance both internationally and domestically in many countries as it occurs with the United States and Mexico. And in some, migration is coupled with profound demographic and labor market changes in the United States and Mexico. And I'm a strong believer that a better bilateral management of the migration phenomenon can help both the Mexico and the United States to take advantage of these complementary population structures and labor markets in a way that it increases our competitiveness. And also, if we work together, it can help us address share legitimate security concerns. Let me give you some examples. The US Census Bureau estimates that in the United States, the percentage of people whose age is between 20 and 44 years will decrease from roughly 33% to 32% over the next 14 years, that is from 2006 to 2020. And consequently, for those who are 45 years or older, the percentage will increase for roughly from 39% to 41%. But at the same time, in Mexico's, Mexico's economically active population will grow significantly during that period. This age group will increase during the same time roughly 10% during the same period. That is from 28% to 41%. The immigration, the immigrant community in the United States, not only Mexicans, for, but from many different nationalities, helps fill essential job shortages in the United States. And it also contributes to job creation in the United States. According also to data from the Commerce Department, the number of businesses belonging to the Hispanic community in the United States, around half of them of Mexican origin, has increased four times faster than the rest of US origin enterprises. At the same time, and perhaps more importantly, the terrible events of September 11, 2001, an act which is absolutely condemnable in itself, have prompted worldwide a revaluation of the ways in which we can assure a safe and a secure and efficient movement of people across our borders. And this is happening worldwide, and certainly between Mexico and the United States. Over the past year, security has taken an unprecedented importance, and the linkage between migration and security will continue to be forcefully present in our bilateral agenda. The point is, and I hope to persuade at least some of you, that to the extent that more and better channels for legal immigration, and I emphasize legal immigration, are established, the resources that both countries use to safeguard the security of our border and of our region, I believe will be better focused to fight the threats posed by either terrorism or organized crime. Now the second question is, Mexico talks about shared responsibility. Why do you have a Mexican official talking to you here about this topic, since this is a domestic issue? Let me try to explain myself. Since early 2001, when our presidents met in Guanajuato, they agreed, and I quote, that both governments recognize that migration and its relation with border safety 
is a shared responsibility. So let me try to narrow this concept of shared responsibility that I believe should be used more frequently on both sides of the border. First, on the economic front, and this has to be said very clearly, Mexico is the first and foremost responsible for the well-being of its people. Mexico must continue to expand opportunities in Mexico to assure that migration is a decision and not a necessity, as it many times happened. Indeed, if the globalized environment has changed the conception of time and distance, thereby increasing the flows of goods, money, and people, it also calls upon countries to responsibly take advantage of this opportunity and enhance the well-being of their peoples. On the other hand, shared responsibility means, I believe, that the United States should recognize that there, there is a presence of pull factors as part of the equation, and that an important contribution is made by Mexicans and people from other nationalities to the economy of this country. And second, on the security front, the increased linkage between security and migrations and border is a reality that is present in the relationship. Mexico acknowledges the need to consider these three elements, security, migration, and borders, when drawing up migration and security policies of our own. A modern and a secure border and region is in the interest of both nations. And as such, we must work together to safeguard our border and our region under the principle of shared responsibility. Now, the natural question is, is Mexico doing its share? Is Mexico putting its money where its mouth is? Let me talk briefly about this point. Beyond any doubt, Mexico and the United States have a very complex relation. And hence, this relation is sometimes viewed through the lens of misinformation, misconception, or sometimes, frankly, ill will on either side of the border. Much too often, Mexico and my government is described as cynic because it decisively promotes a comprehensive immigration reform while it refuses to take care of its own problems and promotes illegal immigration into the United States. This is not the case, and I will try to explain why. Allow me again to make reference to the security and the economy. Until very recently, Mexico was indeed trapped in economic, a cycle of economic crisis. And speaking openly about migration, in Mexico, emigration from Mexico to the United States was politically incorrect, to say the least, because it implied a recognition, at least a tacit recognition, of our own economic failures, at least for two decades. And yes, Mexico still faces many domestic challenges. But accordingly, as it was said by Senator Martinez, and I appreciated his comments, the Fox administration has promoted policies and legislative reforms precisely to enhance our competitiveness and to improve our economic development. And let me give you some examples. <clears throat> Thanks to a responsible management of public finances, we have an inflation rate, we have achieved an inflation rate of 3.3%, the lowest in 37 years. We have single digit interest rates for the first time and our economy is growing right now at a healthy rate of 5.3%. Talking about free trade, free trade investment and agreement, Mexico has free trade agreements with over 42 economies in the world, which imply a yearly trade of $435 billion. During President Fox administration, that's it's over the last six years, Mexico has received a hundred, over $100 billion worth of foreign direct investment. And the vast majority of it comes from its trading partners, the United States and Canada. Our administration public deficit will be the lowest in 30 years, and yet we will have spent more on our people than any other administration. For example, Oportunidades, which is Mexico's federal government program, main social program. Over the past, we have been able to take out of poverty roughly 5 million people over the past, 5 million families over the past years. Those families now receive health, education, and nutritional support. Also, we have spent spending, uh, spending on education has increased roughly 70% over the past five years. And great progress has been made in housing. We are building over 750,000 homes a year. 
And in the last six years, more than three million Mexicans have gained access to a decent home. Are we satisfied with the results so far? Absolutely not. And we cannot be satisfied. But are things pointing in the right direction? I sincerely believe so. On the other side, the management of a 2,000 plus mile border, which involves on a daily basis over 1 million legal crossings and over $750 million daily worth of trade going both sides, is certainly a daunting task. And also much too often the Mexican government is described as being insensible to the security concerns or unwilling to work with the United States. And yet, US-Mexico security cooperation in this field frequently goes unnoticed or at least unwritten of. And as it stands now, it's really unprecedented. Let me refer to some concrete actions. In 2002, Mexico and the United States established the US-Mexico Border Security Partnership Plan. We're building sentry lanes for people to cross legally and more easily into the United States. We are improving our fast and secure trade system. In March of, the, of this year, both governments signed an action plan to combat border violence and establish joint protocols to respond to border security emergencies. Last year, our presidents and the Prime Minister of Canada kicked off the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America. We are working together through that partnership to implement common border security and bioprotection strategies to improve aviation and maritime security and to enhance intelligence sharing. Last summer, the Mexico and US governments together launched the OASIS program, a program which is designed to identify and prosecute smugglers, human smugglers, and safeguard the lives of uh, migrants that are targeted by these criminals. So far, 150 cases have been put together by this joint program. A security strategy is about identifying risks, assigning them probabilities, and then acting together with the resources available to reduce those probabilities. And we're doing that, we're doing precisely that. What is our view on what is happening on, on the United States? First, let me st stress very clearly that the Mexican government respects the right of the United States to enforce its laws and to protect its citizens at borders. From the beginning of the administration, President Fox has promoted the creation of new mechanisms in order to guarantee that migration that happens between Mexico and the United States is legal, it's safe, it's orderly, and it respects the rights of people. And the Mexican has a firm conviction that reaching this objective will contribute to the prosperity and the security of both of our nations. Also, the Mexican government strongly believes, as it has been said, that comprehensive reform is needed. That is, a reform that does address security, but a reform that also creates and modernizes the currently existing temporary worker programs, and also offers an opportunity to address the status of many people, millions of people who are already here. As it has been said, the reform that was approved in the Senate, in the US Senate, was a very important step forward in our opinion. But we must recognize that there's still much more debate ahead. And therefore, let me reiterate what are my government's position in this regard. One, to continue to expand jobs and economic growth and social opportunities in Mexico to make migration no longer a necessity. Two, to develop and enforce migration laws and policies with full respect to human rights and the safety of citizens on both sides of the border. And also to continue to fight all forms of human smuggling and trafficking. And three, to adjust Mexico's migration policy to safeguard our borders under the principle of shared responsibility. In all truth, we're in the middle of a ping pong of reactions between the governments, which I believe reflect valid concerns on both sides and underscore the unusually complex moment our bilateral relation is currently in. And I cannot emphasize enough our conviction that it will take more than enforcement only measures to truly solve the challenges posed by the immigration phenomenon. There are many ways in which we can, the last question, can we achieve a better bilateral management of migration? The short answer in my opinion is certainly yes, we can. Again, a long-standing solution would imply that the reform creates the opportunity for hard-working, tax-paying workers to earn legal status. 
This does not mean that they should benefit vis-a-vis -vis legal immigrants who seek permanent residence. This does not mean that the Mexican government is in favor of an amnesty also. But it's hard to imagine that people who have been here for almost a decade perhaps, that have perhaps two children that were born here, maybe a small house, a car, a dog, and you press me a bit of mortgage, will simply leave the place that has given them that opportunity. And that is something to think about. The other thing is to the extent that we believe that a guest worker program is needed in the future to manage better the migration phenomenon, there are ways in which we can, in fact, make an art of promoting circularity and matching willing employees with willing employees. Through bilateral cooperation, relevant authorities on both sides can put together a mechanism that makes it attractive for workers to voluntarily contribute a portion of their savings to a tax-preferred saving account that they can collect when they return to the Mexico or to their native countries. Appropriate housing is also one of the major elements that determines the attachments of someone to a, con to a community and therefore to a country. Recently, CONAFOBI, the Mexican government agency in charge of housing, began developing a program for transnational mortgages and three Mexican firms are already established operations in the United States. Private health insurance from Mexico, companies from Mexico and the United States have expressed their interest in developing binational health insurance scheme. It is plausible that such a coverage can be considered as part of a temporary guest worker program. And this is important because of the concern that migration has in the healthcare cost is in the United States. We have signed also agreements, for example, with the, the Department of Labor of the United States to improve compliance and, a worker, and awareness with workplace laws and regulations through information sharing, outreach, training, and exchange. We can do a lot of things together if we live and if we believe that there is a shared responsibility to do this issue. In closing, the Mexican government will continue to work for a better bilateral management of the migration phenomenon between Mexico and the United States and to promote a comprehensive re reform. We will do it with attention to the high political complexity this issue involves for the society in the United States, but also fully conscious that it can only be solved with vision, with courage, and with a sense of commitment on the part of all actors involved. The United States rightly prides itself as a country whose strength and character come from its diversity. And Mexico is proud of its people here, whose working spirit and moral values contribute every day to the economy and to the society of this great nation. Thank you very much. Earlier, there was a discussion about the impact of NAFTA and American businesses going to Mexico. And somebody from the audience used the descriptor sweatshops. So I wonder to what degree you think that's an accurate description and, and, and how has the presence of more American businesses in Mexico been beneficial or to some degree maybe negative? The, the, the impact on NAFTA on Mexico's economy is a, is a very important question. And it's always referred to in the context of the migration debate. Is NAFTA, uh, as it was recently uh, commented by a lady here, is NAFTA responsible for all this? Uh, my, my opinion, and a very clear one, is absolutely not. NAFTA has been successful for the three countries, and it has been successful to Mexico. In terms of its original objectives and uh, development, what do I mean by that? As I mentioned, over the past 10 years, Mexico has received $100 billion worth of foreign direct investment that has created jobs in Mexico. Now, a vast majority of that comes from the United States and Mexico, from the United States and Canada. Trade flows have grown exponentially over the last years. Now, over half, roughly half of the new employer uh, positions, employment positions created for the manufacturing sector in Mexico are linked to firms that are exporting now. Having said that, and again emphasizing that NAFTA has been, I believe, quite successful in terms of its original objective, 
it's not enough. And the problem was that it was oversold, perhaps in Mexico, as a solution to all our problems. Let me stress something very clearly. I don't think that the United States will help Mexico more than Mexico is willing to help itself. And we have a lot of things to do, and we're doing them, OK? But it's not easy, and it takes time to take a, to take a country around. Now, going again to NAFTA, those are, those are hard figures now. There are no sweatshops. There are rules, both bilateral and unilateral in Mexico, that will punish and will prosecute the violation of labor rights in Mexico. And when NAFTA was signed, there was a side agreement there precisely to address labor standard concerns. This doesn't mean that we don't have challenges. And there have been cases. But for example, those jobs that are associated in Mexico to the export activity, people are, are earning roughly between 15 to 40 percent more than the rest of the economy. The huge challenge is in the agricultural sector. And that is true. NAFTA has been difficult for the agricultural Mexican sector. And we have to recognize that. Okay? But why is it that? Because we have 25 million people that depend from the agricultural sector, especially on grains and very specific crops. Okay? And we and agricultural GDP in Mexico is three to four percent. We need to enhance the productivity of our agricultural sector so these people in that sector can have a better living standard. Now, we have suffered on some sectors, for example, on grain. We import a lot of grain from the United States. And many poor Mexican families depended on grain. But we're doing wonderfully. We're exporting tomatoes, avocados, and many other agricultural products to the United States and elsewhere. And, and those people are doing very well. This is a process of adjustment. And free trade implies that certain sectors will suffer and certain sectors will boom. Bottom balance, I believe that NAFTA has implied net job employment creation. And that doesn't mean that we should not adopt other policies to address the results of some results that have been difficult for Mexico regarding NAFTA. And on the first panel, one of the speakers made a reference to an uh, old proverb about fishing. And I'd like to ask um, what you think America has done to teach Mexico how to fish. That, that uh, concept that was addressed in the previous panels is, is absolutely correct. And this, this is an issue that was addressed by Senator Martinez. He very clearly said, I mean, it's very clear that average income in the United States is roughly $36,000, perhaps. I, I may be mistaken. And Mexico's is roughly 9000 so it's a huge difference. Uh, and the idea about uh, learning, uh, teaching people how to fish instead of giving me the fish is absolutely correct. We are, and that is a policy that the Mexican, at least this current administration, has promoted in terms of this social policy. Let me give you an example of how are we working together. Three years ago, the United States and Mexico signed an agreement that allows for the Overseas Private Investment Corporation of the United States, which is a quasi-public, quasi-private entity of the US government that promotes investment worldwide and development to enter into Mexico. And that is important because it provides financing for anybody, any US citizen who decides to invest abroad in an enterprise uh, so long as 25% of the capital has uh, someone from the US. Over the past two years, through OPIC, we have invested, uh, people have invested in Mexico around $600 million in the first two years. And that investment is helping us create jobs and development, and we welcome it. That's a good example of what we can do together. It is also true that Mexico should think very thoroughly about some reforms 
that we have not accomplished and that I believe we should accomplish in the electricity sector, in the labor front, in the fiscal front. And that is true. And that is why I mentioned that I find it difficult for the United States to help Mexico more than Mexico is willing to help itself. There are many things that we're doing together also through the USDA or through the United States Trade Development Authority. We are working together. Uh, but again, and I, I, I have to return to the fact that it is, th these things don't get constructed over just a short period of time. But what I try to emphasize in my presentation it is, is that precisely Mexico is working towards that. Because we understand that the solution for migration is, as I said, to create the best opportunities available for our people in Mexico. Mexico loses when our people are forced to leave. And that was not recognized previously. It's being recognized now. And I think that it provides a solid base by which our governments can work together to address this issue. If you could, I'd like you to clarify possibly uh, President Fox's comments about American citizenship rights given to these immigrants that come mm -hmm. over here illegally. If you could clarify that, because I don't, I don't know that our newspapers give us really what, the, what, his, what his belief is or what the Mexican government's belief is. Uh, I, no. I like my rights as an American citizen. They're, they're my birthright. And I certainly wouldn't want to just give them to somebody that walks across my, the border, it, especially illegally. So could you clarify for me maybe sure. President Fox's statements? It's a very, it's a very important topic, and uh, I, I, will, I will gladly clarify it because I think it's important. Uh, let, me, let me start by saying, you, you just mentioned something that is true. I mean, this is, and, and for the right reasons and understandable reasons, this is a very thorny and complex and sensitive issue for both societies because it's really the human face of our relation. And in that sense, it's liable, they're liable to be misunderstandings. And we, although we attend to, perhaps we, ne we sometimes are not able to clarify what our positions are on these views. And I think it's very important. So I take very well your question. You're going to a very profound issue which has to do with citizenship and assimilation. Uh, earlier there was a question about language also uh, addressed. Let me be very clear. Number one, the Mexican government does not promote nor support illegal immigration into the United States or elsewhere. Number two, the right for someone to become a citizen here in the United States should be determined by U.S. institutions and by the U.S. people. Number three, the Mexican government does not promote, nor it will do so, that its citizens become citizens of another country because that reflects a failure on our part. Nevertheless, I can understand why someone would want to become a citizen of this country, but that is an independent decision of an individual, not of the Mexican government, and the Mexican government is not advocating that. Why would someone that arrived 12 years ago and that was given opportunity would not want to become a citizen of the United States? It's a good question. I think many will. Not all of them, but many will. But that is up to the individual to decide according to the procedures that are established by the United States. What the Mexican government wants is for people, around 5.5 million Mexicans that are already here in the United States, without authorization, okay, to have an opportunity to earn legal status. Now, it was been said, what does legal status mean? We believe that it is in the interest of the United States to get these people out of the shadows. Citizenship is a completely different story, okay? And that is what the Mexican government believe. And at the same time, they are, and this doesn't also mean that it's against assimilation. If people are here, and I think that Senator Martinez was right on Mark, when he said, well, if someone's here, he will do far better if he learns English, okay? now. People say Mexicans don't want to assimilate. I can't, I, I can't really, I don't have enough elements to answer those questions. There are studies on both sides of the debate that show both things. That do show if there's assimilation specs, especially on second or third generation, okay? 
And that is an open question. But I think, with all due respect, that there also has to be raised a question. If they are not assimilating fully, is it only because of them? Or the current environment and the color legal scheme is also not promoting assimilation? That is something, citizenship is something for the individual to decide. We want, meaning the Mexican government, to have avenues that are legal, safe, and orderly in a way that benefit both people. And we know who is crossing the border and for what reasons. And I think that's, that's it, it hasn't been always easy to explain that here. And that's why I'm here to clarify those things with you. No? Um, I wanted to ask you what Mexico is doing on um, social policies for the poor, the welfare, something like that. There, there's really three things. The first one has to do with the stability, economic stability. In 1995, for example, we had an economic crisis that essentially uh, cut in half the income of all Mexicans. Okay? If you don't have economic stability, you cannot have economic development. Okay? We are working, I think, uh, in a fairly responsible and diligent manner to have economic stability. We just had an election, the most, you know, the closest election in Mexico's history, in a very complicated political context. Previously, a situation like that would have probably implied the uh, flight of capital and economic uncertainty, and that did not happen, because the responsible thing to do is have very sound, solid macroeconomic policies, okay? Because if not, you put in risk the income of the people. Number two, that is not enough. So we are, you obviously need to work to bring the regions and the sectors and the people that are far in lagger, lagging quicker to the mainstream of economic development. Uh, the Mexican government, for example, has, has a couple of programs, but the most important one, as I mentioned, Oportunidades, is a program that provides education, health, and nutritional support for, for poor fam families in Mexico. And over the past five years, that program has reached 25, 5 million Mexicans, roughly 25, uh, five, 5 million families, Mexican families, which is roughly 25 million Mexicans. And we still have 40% of our population in poverty. That's true. But it cannot be solved in, in a generation. That's an issue that you have to work very diligently. And the third is that President Fox administration promoted a series of reforms on the labor front to strengthen the rule of law, as it was said previously, that is important, to strengthen property rights, to uh, bring private investment into certain sectors of the Mexican economy which had been closed in a way that we can have greater development. And uh, as I mentioned during my presentation, are we satisfied? No, we're not, and we cannot be. But I do believe that things are pointing in the right direction. And the next administration will continue to work towards that end. Okay, there are Americans that feel that illegal immigrants have broken US laws. And US laws should be enforced. If the um, Homeland Security were to increase uh, immigration quotas and allow the number of uh, immigrants needed uh, in U.S. Uh, labor force and immigrants to come to the United States legally, is the Mexican government equipped to process uh, all of the necessary applications to uh, comply with uh, U.S. laws? I mentioned that I, I try to stress the fact that the Mexican government does not promote undocumented or illegal immigration into the United States. And the question you're asking is often asked to me, what are you prepared, what is the Mexican government prepared to do? And this issue of shared responsibility implies that we acknowledge that people should not migrate illegally to the United States or elsewhere. 
in February of this year, a group of Mexican academics, the three major political parties in Mexico, government, the Human Rights Commission, sat together and put a public position which is called Mexico on the Migration Phenomenon. And that position stresses very clearly that to the extent that there are, and I'm, I'm sorry, let me go back, and it was, it was approved as a joint resolution of our federal Congress, both the last one and the one who has just entered, and I have it here with me and I can leave you a copy, but it's public, that stresses that to the extent that there are sufficient legal avenues available for people to migrate legally, the Mexican government should guarantee that they do it with the appropriate documentation and also through the appropriate legal channels. Now, let me, let me be honest about this, because this is very important. Over the past years, the United States has spent a lot of resources to do that. And results are mixed at best. We don't have so many resources, to, even, even if we attempt to do that. We don't have so many resources. So the question is, can you do, and this is the point, can you do it at the same time? Mexicans don't have a genetic chip implant that tells them, I want to go and migrate and break the US law. And that is very important to recognize. If, why would someone risk their life crossing this Arizona Sonora Desert with two kids less than five years old? They're, if there's a legal avenue, they will use it. And the question, are there enough legal? avenues right now? I believe they're not. And I say this respectfully for the United States and United States institution. If we establish them, the Border Patrol and our security people at the border will be far more centered and focused on true security threats. Let me say something to conclude. And I will leave, you the, I, I will leave the paper for all of you to review them because it's a public position supported by the full, uh, fully by the US Congress and the Mexican government. It's a mistake to think, I believe, as Mexicans, migrants, as a threat to the national security of the United States. They are not. It is also a mistake for Mexicans to think that it is impossible for someone to cross from Mexico to the United States to harm the United States a nation that is a friend, a partner, and a neighbor. And that is why we're acting accordingly. But whenever this debate is dominated by extreme position or disinformed positions, those people on both sides of the border who are trying to achieve a reasonable, fair sol solution see the margins of maneuver diminish. And I think that's something very important to keep in mind. Based on what you said earlier about the instability in the Mexican government right now, you say that you're stepping in the right direction, but will the continued instability, especially in the elections, the whole fallout from that in these past months, will that affect the actual policy that Mexico is putting forth right now? I, um, thank you. Um, I did not, I mean, I, I talk essentially about economic stability. Uh, and I refer that for two decades, Mexico, Mexico had recurrent economic crisis uh, because of economic stability. I don't believe we do have that problem right now. And uh, the, the reason is that macroeconomic variables are fairly stable. And you can take a look at, not, not a, what I'm saying, but that some of the indicators that financial markets worldwide are placing on the Mexican economy. Now, there is a... There, is, there was a very contested and close election in Mexico just recently. And uh, Mexico is a very vibrant but young democracy. So we're still coping with establishing new rules to, to, to deal with democracy. Um, but there is, not, there is no political stability. There are strong, hard political debates about what is the path that Mexico should take in the future, okay? A debate that is pretty much lively throughout the Western Hemisphere, not only in Mexico. But there is no political instability. There is, I would say, a unusually high political effervescence in Mexico. 
and uh, but we're working very very diligently to keep the economy going and keep political debate civilized and productive as possible. Uh, Mr. Undersecretary, I appreciate the candor and the direct way you've addressed the questions that have been posed to you. And I think you've actually uh, changed what the focus of this should be. And it's not so much the change in American immigration policy, but a, a, our being able to adapt to our neighbors' need to be able to work with us as partners. And I, I appreciate your candor on that. One thing I would like you to, to try to address is, at least here in the city of Orlando, the local counselor's office has been issuing documentation that has been utilized by Mexican nationals to try and uh, obtain bank accounts and other ways of uh, having identity papers that are recognized in the United States. This seems contrary to what you said about not supporting uh, illegal mm -hmm. immigration. Sure. It's a good question. And you're referring to the matricula consular, I guess, to the high security matricula consular. Let, let me, that, that is a document that it is common on consular practice worldwide. Uh, in Mexico, it has been with us for over 137 years. And in fact, if you look at some of the statements on the part of the State Department records, the United States also issues some form of documentation in posts abroad to its citizens now. The matricula consular has been viewed or sometimes placed as a, as a Mexican attempt to a backdoor approach to regularization, okay? That is not the case, and I'll tell you why. The matricula consular does not have absolutely any bearing on the immigration status of an individual. If someone has the matricula consular and they're here illegally, it does not mean that they cannot be deported, okay? But the matricula consular, and I have to be honest about it, does improve significantly their quality of life here for some of the reasons that you mentioned. First, it does allow them in some instances to open a bank account. Now, the concern about uh, linking financial resources to terrorism or organized crime activities, the matricula consular has been blamed uh, in the way that we, they shouldn't be allowed to open an account because that will inc increase insecurity in the conditions in terms of financial flows. Whereas every, you know, the State Department, the Treasury Department, and many other people think it's completely the opposite. You will have people within the formal financial sector. Now, it is true that also that has allowed Mexican nationals to enter the banking system and when they send money home, save resources. It's true. It improves their lives. Uh, it also has allowed Mexican nationals in certain communities to identify themselves. Again, all sorts of local authorities, including police. The matricula consular, the new one, the very new one, started in Texas because the sheriff, in, in, in Austin, the sheriff there was interested in having Mexican nationals come out, okay, and report crime because they were not doing so for being afraid of being deported. And we did that, and crime dropped by 50%. No? But again, it's not being completely honest. It does help them while they're here. But the attempt is not to use it as a backdoor approach to regularization or immigration. And it does not have any bearing, absolutely, on their migration status. And when people get a matricula consular, the consular office very clearly explains that. We have the responsibility of doing everything in our power through the appropriate political and diplomatic channels to help our people here. And, we're, and that is the result, of the, the matricula consular is pretty much the result of that. Now, are we working, the, the matricula consular has appeared sometimes even in campaign ads in the United States next to the photograph of Osama bin Laden. I, I can provide anybody a copy, please, the Consul General here, Jaime Pazis Puentes here, a full description of how we issue it. What are the security measures that we issue it? And for people to view, okay? We are also concerned about the security.